with Dar Holland Hagal, uh, Dean Argagas, uh, Crescent Cano. Uh, welcome, one and all. Uh, that was a tune that we know as Come to Good. It was a tune in a book written down by a man called John Giddy. John Giddy lived in the parish of Key, southwest of Truro, from 1707 to 1759. Two of his sons were very influential in West Cornwall, and one of his grandsons became nationally famous. John was a musician, and as a result, his family were musical. Importantly for us, he was the compiler of one of the earliest surviving manuscripts of Cornish social music. His 64-page music notebook was compiled between about 1725 and 1750, and it's preserved here in Crescent Kerno. The aim of today's talk is to tell you about John and his music, enjoy some of it, albeit in modern arrangements, and to help me, I have uh, Tina here and Barbara. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, between us, we will tell you about John and his family. Uh, we'll describe the musical environment. We'll study his music and its instrumentation. And we'll mention its rediscovery and its publication. Now, John Giddy's time was the time of the minuet. So we're going to start off with a tune we know as John Giddy's Minuet.
great disadvantage if you're a historian when a family favorite Christian name is adopted by many generations in turn. This extended family can cause endless genealogical confusion and debate. John Giddy was one of several generations to follow this pattern in the parish of Key, just south of Truro. In this area, there were oak woods, prized for the tanning industry. There was good farmland for cereal crops, good grazing for stock, damson and apple orchards. Key plums were renowned. And there, the Giddy family owned properties at Trelease, Nansavallon, and Kalenic. Significantly, these, especially at Kalenic, were really close to areas rich in tin ore. In the late 17th century, there was an early smelting works at Kalinic. It was known as a blowing house and a set of tin stamps for crushing the ore. And as early as 1711, this was updated, a reverberatory furnace was installed. It burnt Welsh sea coal. Keys were also built at Kalinic so that the coal could be delivered and the ore shipped out. In roughly 180 years of operation, the Kalinic Smelting Company was one of the most successful in Cornwall and the Giddy family were associated with works for over 50 years. It's possible that they originally owned the land on which the works were built, but agriculture and tin were the foundations of their prosperity. John Giddy's father, unsurprisingly also called John Giddy, lived from 1678 to 1739. He married Joyce Benithan of Ken Wynne in 1704, and we know of four of their children, our John appears to have been their eldest. And it was probably to Kalenic Farmhouse that John Giddy took his bride, Anna Collins of Philac, after their marriage in September 1731. All his subsequent letters are just headed Kalenic. When we first researched John Giddy in the year 2000, we were unaware of a totally separate letter book. Through these letters, we found that John Giddy was not just a gentleman farmer, but he was also in the cutting edge of the Industrial Revolution and a knowledgeable industrial businessman. He seems to have held one or more senior positions in the Kalenic Smelting Company, possibly as an assayer. The sound of the tin made when it was bent was called the cry of the tin. And by this sound, a skilled assayer could assess the quality of the ore, as well as by its weight and appearance. And from his letters, it appears that John had these skills. He was well-educated and astute, a fluent writer with an easy-to-read copperplate hand. And some of you will realise how important an easy-to-read copperplate hand is. It's unique in Cornwall to find a book of interesting tunes so well-supported by informative collection of letters. Although, sadly for us, he doesn't ever discuss his own music making or his musical friends. John and Anna had four sons, all of whom reached maturity. John, Edward, William, and Thomas. Sadly, a baby daughter, Anna, died very young. And there's a whole file of correspondence dating from 1752 to 1759, between John Giddy and his son Edward, who was at Christ College, Oxford, reading theology. There were chatty family information scattered throughout the letters. John was an affectionate but concerned father that Edward should work diligently. He should not neglect to write to his family and he shouldn't get into bad company or waste his opportunities. Edward already played the violin, but at Oxford, further tuition was delayed because of the expense of the letters. He purchased sheet music for a Corelli solo to practice in the meantime. And refreshingly stated, it's pretty difficult, but I should be able to play it by the time I reach clinic. Edward eventually started lessons in 1753, his father writing that he wished Edward to begin lessons, but only to give him a true notion of bowing and stopping justly in tune, which is what we call fingering. 
As for time, this will come in due course. A letter on the 7th of October, 1754, mostly dealt with accounts and encouraging Edward to write to his mother. But John closed with a complaint. I should write more, but for the noise of the violins and the dancers overhead, it is our feast on Monday. Clearly, Cornish musicians and dancers were as noisy then as some can be today. Some years after his father's death and burial at Key Parish Church in 1759, Edward was ordained and he served as curate at St Earth's. There he married Catherine Davies and their son, Davies Giddy, was born in 1767. And it's thanks to him that we have the Giddy archive here in Crescent Kernow. Davies took the name Gilbert on his marriage to an heiress, and it was as Davies Gilbert that he became famous. He was a polymath, a renowned mathematician, advising many famous engineers of his day. He became the president of the Royal Society, and he was a meticulous historian. In 1822, he published a pioneering collection of Cornish carols and folk songs, and he enthusiastically promoted Trelawney as a Cornish anthem. Davis Gilbert also compiled a parochial history of Cornwall, published in 1838, and there he describes both Nancy Vallon and Trelease from his memories as a youth, some 25 years or so after the death of his grandfather. He describes the actual apple orchards at Nancy Vallon, and John Giddy himself had written of replanting apple trees in those orchards. Of John Giddy's other sons, we know something of Thomas. He became a prominent surgeon in Penzance. There he was a well-respected town mayor many times, and it was he, it is claimed, that in 1805 famously broke the news of the Battle of Trafalgar to a gathering in the assembly rooms in Penzance. Significantly, he was also the president of the Penzance Orchestral Society. Through Edward and Thomas, John's interest in music had continued to the next generation.
So what was the musical world like that this book was written in? As we've heard, John Giddy lived between 1707 and 1759, so his music book was probably written between 725 and 750, and that's the time, roughly, that we call the Baroque. And, of course, London was the centre for music at that time. Its rise as a commercial and social centre led to an influx of gifted composers and performers, or, as one critic of the time lamented, a great number of foreign fiddlers. <laughs> George Frederick Handel came from Germany and became a naturalised Briton and was a defining influence on the music of the time. His work had enormous popularity from 724 onwards and the music of Geminiani and Corelli was also popular. From 1737 there were theatres, Covent Garden and Drury Lane and they staged both ballad operas and more serious productions. John Gay's Beggar's Opera, laden with popular songs, remained in production for several decades and was followed by many other such shows, pretty much like the musicals of today. At the same time, on the London stage, the English <coughs> mask had given way to an overriding appetite for Italian opera, and professional singers and actors commanded eye-watering fees. There were pleasure gardens at Vauxhall and Ranley, and these allowed almost anyone to enjoy musical performances, refreshments, social interaction, both proper and illicit, at all levels of society, for just a modest entry fee. But what about Cornwall? Well, in John Giddy's time, there was no theatre, no concert hall, no assembly room or public pleasure garden in Cornwall. Outside centres like Bath and London, no musician could actually make a career purely from concerts. So most supplemented their income by working as church organists, teaching at the houses of the gentry, playing for private concerts and dances, or by selling, repairing, and maintaining musical instruments. This was a time when private music making, as distinguished from sort of aristocratic performance, was gaining in popularity. John Giddy was one of an increasing number of gifted amateurs who met to play together informally, although often to a very high standard. Also, we shouldn't forget the legions of wives and daughters for whom musical proficiency was an essential skill, although one only displayed inside the home or at appropriate social gatherings. Cartoons and descriptions of the time show local musicians playing in pubs, playing for gold eyes or harvest home in barns, and also for dancing in and out of doors. John's music tells us that he played for dancing to accompany songs and perhaps as a soloist. And as we heard, John wrote from Kalenic that on feast and Monday, the violin and the dancers in the room above were disturbing his letter writing. He doesn't say if the noisemakers were family or friends or employees. Other possible venues were the Six Bells in Kalenic, then owned by one James Giddy, probably a brother or a cousin, and the Red Lion Inn and Tavern in Boscowan Street, Truro, where yet another Mr Giddy was the landlord for many years. In many ways, John's musical outlets were the same as many amateur musicians today, the home, the workplace, and the public house. But John Giddy lived in a time of change. In the lifetimes of his musical sons, Edward and Thomas, we saw the rise of musical societies, glee cups, choirs, and though this time what we understand as a concert was a fragile and rather unstructured concept. As the century progressed, the increasing number of affluent Cornish families retained houses in London, encouraging the flow and exchange of musical ideas. Even before Truro Assembly Rooms were built in 1780, music was gaining in popularity amongst an emerging middle class who were willing to cooperate with physically professionals to perform publicly music of the theatre, of the pleasure garden, the church, the dance and the chamber orchestra. What we can identify of John Giddy's music is a microcosm of the musical taste of his time, a snapshot of the musical environment in the early 18th century. John wrote his book at a time when great changes were occurring in society and culture, and we are very fortunate to have this glimpse of the process as it happened in Cornwall.
John's little book was probably used as a handy pocket reference. Of course, it contains only those pieces he decided to write down, and it may only be a fraction of what he played. Well-known tunes wouldn't have needed to have been recorded, and of course, unpopular tunes would have been left out. He probably used the book to help learn and remember tunes just entering his repertoire. In other words, it's an aspirational document. Much of the collection is unnamed and unattributed. Nonetheless, we can learn a lot from it. As you've heard, uh, John was contemporary with Handel, Bach and O'Carolan, the famous Irish harper, and his music has this same late Baroque feel. It comprises dance tunes, song melodies and accompaniments. The tunes comprise long hornpipes, we just heard one of them, extended jigs, rigadons and minuets, all from before the time that country dances became popular. Let me just explain those. A long hornpipe, like Ravencorft's, is a tune in 3-2 time. It was well known from the 16th to the 18th centuries. And the name apart, it's absolutely nothing like the sailor's hornpipes found from the mid-18th century, which have a 4-4 or 12-8 rhythm and a characteristic ending with the final chord repeated three times. An extended jig is a swift tune, usually in compound time, like 12-8 or 9-8, and it has long phrase lengths. It's much more like the jigs found in dance suites by composers like Corelli or Handel uh, than the jigs used for country dances in the 18th and 19th century. The rigodon, which is also spelt rigodon and rigadoon, uh, is a sprightly country dance with a lively duple metre. The characteristic rhythm is da, dit, dit, da, like that. And it usually has a regular eight-bar phrase. Originating in France, it was already old hat by John Giddy's time. And of course, the minuet is another couple dance of French origin, usually in 3-4 time, and it was popular from about 1690 to 1790, displacing the rigodon. Like jigs, minuets became part of dance suites by Baroque composers, and initially the minuet usually just had a, a binary structure with two repeated sections of eight bars. Uh, later, what happened was that the second section kind of expanded and gave contrast using modulation and changes of orchestration. One tune, the new minuet, is found in other Cornish manuscript books, especially that of from Morville House, dated about 1770, which shows a wider popularity of this material in Cornwall. Morville, of course, is quite near Lou, uh, which is where the extended Giddy family uh, had shares in several ships and in a weaving business. Although most of the music is firmly diatonic, in other words, it uses what we would understand as conventional major and minor keys, um, many of the tunes have a modal minor sort of a feel to them. These include Ravencroft's Hornpipe, Come to Good, The Bells of Old Key, and The Waters of Tresillion. Uh, the modality was already old-fashioned in Baroque times. You do find some early Playford tunes are a bit like that, and I just wonder if these tunes are a, a hankering after past times that's coexisting with a familiarity with the latest musical fashions. Inevitably, Giddy's book includes works attributed to Handel and Geminiani, and others written for or by Ravenscroft, Claudie Phillips, a Welsh violinist, John Brown, a librettist and friend of Handel, and Monsieur Dupre, who was a celebrated dancer. The book includes popular songs such as 
Chloe is false, but still she's charming. I hope there's nobody called Chloe here today. Uh, there's also when youth and beauty can't make way. I think I can safely announce that one, as everybody here is young and beautiful, that's all right. It, it, it also contains uh, tunes and bass lines of songs from the fashionable ballad operas of the day. Some of them were sung at the newly fashionable Vauxhall Gardens, which opened in 1732. And two singers' names are mentioned, Miss Stevenson and Mr Riley. They help us date this material and show us that John Giddy was aware of the latest pop songs of his time. A little bit later, John Giddy was a subscriber, that means an advanced purchaser, of a set of 12 sonatas for violins with a bass by violin, cello or harpsichord by a man called William Boyce that was published in 1747. But other subscribers to this piece of music were Mr. Walter Rosewarn and John Sharp, both then living in Truro. So perhaps they were two of John's musical companions. The three of them could have made up the trio that would have played this music. We can't prove it, but it seems quite likely. So to summarise, John played for dancing. He accompanied popular songs. He played with other musicians. He liked the latest music, but also he had a fondness for older material. I think he was just like us. <laughs> What instruments were they playing this stuff on? Well, there's two ways of deciding that. Firstly, we could look at the music itself and see what instruments it could be played on and which ones it couldn't be played on. And secondly, we can have a look at what people were writing about at the time, what kind of instruments they saw being played. So let's start by having a look at John Giddy's music itself. Well, there's two pieces by famous violinists, Geminiani and Claudius Phillips. Then, as Mike mentioned earlier, we have songs, and the music was to accompany the songs both women singers and men singers. Then we have a piece described as within the compass of the flute, but there are at least three others that are below the range of the flute. And what is this flute they're talking about? Remember, this is Baroque times. This, this would have been what they called an English flute. You probably think it looks like a recorder, and you're right. This is the treble size. It came in lots of different sizes, and this one is pitched about F, but there were some of different pitches. Alternatively, the other flute was called the German flute, and that's this thing uh, played across, a transverse flute. It wouldn't have had all the fancy keys that a modern orchestral instrument has. It might have had one or two at the bottom, and it would probably be made of boxwood rather than this. But that's a German flute, and that's an English flute. So, we've got some pieces that could certainly have been played on flutes. 
One piece even has two treble parts, so you might have heard both those instruments together. There are rests within another piece which suggests that there's another instrument playing at the same time. So we can probably think that John Giddy played with a group of other musicians. And as Mike said, he subscribed, he paid for a piece of music for two violins and a bass instrument or harpsichord. And you wouldn't buy that if you weren't expecting to play it with somebody. However, if John Giddy is playing on his own, it's probably a violin. That's his first choice. And we know that he encouraged his son to play a violin. And a violins, of course, in those days weren't quite the same as Mike's. They were Baroque violins, slightly smaller, slightly lighter, strung with gut, slightly shorter fingerboard, and played with a, a different sort of bow. I think you can see that's an out-curved bow. Much lighter sound because it wasn't for a big concert hall. So that's the Baroque violin. Large number of dancers in this collection, so it would certainly work on the violin, although if there were a lot of people shuffling about, more than a few couples, you'd probably need a couple of other instruments as well, a bass instrument, maybe a harpsichord or a spinet. There are bass parts, there are some music with just bass parts, which suggests that John Giddy himself played a bass instrument, possibly a bass viol or a cello, and it, that again suggests that he would have been playing with other people at the time. So, our evidence from inside the music is that you've got one or two or more leading instruments, flutes or violins, and then we've got a bass instrument supporting a violin or a cello or a harpsichord and spinet or all of those, and occasionally singers too. Right, well, that's from inside the music. What evidence have we got from outside? Well, at Tahiti House in 1737, there's an inventory and it contains two German flutes and two recorders. Lawrence Old of Stratton had recorders for sale as early as 1614, and John Opie mentions being taught German flute in Truro in the 1770s. And in the Tahiti inventory, there's also a Cremona violin, and at Heligan, Louis Tremaine paid for his son to have violin lessons in the early 1700s. In 1797, right at the end of that century, Robert Martin of Launceston bequeathed his grandfather's violin and his music books. Direct evidence for keyboard instruments is a bit less frequent. We know that Louis Tremaine paid for his spinet to be tuned, and we know that Philippa Davis of St. Earth played either a spinet or a harpsichord in her mother's house in about 1740 and a harp would be an alternative to a spinet or a harpsichord. Louis Tremaine played, paid an itinerant harper in 1721, and in 1770, Anne Damer played as a visitor a harp at Mount Edgecombe. The bass viol is the larger instrument of the viol family. Reference to bass viols turn up a lot in Cornwall, in church records of West Gallery bands, but these are usually quite a bit later than this, 1780s onwards. And until recently, such reports were dismissed as inaccurate descriptions of cellos. However, the bass viol was the choice for ensemble music of the 17th century, and it was still being made in London in 1724 when Handel wrote bass viol parts for his operas. And I believe there's a bass viol piece in, one of, uh, in the Beggar's Opera, one of the pieces in there. So it was played right the way through the 18th century. And also, it was socially acceptable for a woman to play the bass viol, whereas it wasn't quite so done to play the violin or the flute. That was not considered appropriate. So these external references support the internal references in the music of the kind of instruments that were being played. We've got flutes, violins, bass instrument, some kind of continuing instrument. And if we want further support, in 1758... James Watt, the engineer, though he wasn't an engineer at the time, he was working as a repairer of musical instruments, or what he described as dumb flutes, gouty harps, dislocated violins, and nervous bass viols. <laughs> These, of course, belonged to his customers, the newly emergent middle classes, and they were interested in social music. John Giddy may represent a Cornish example of this new middle-class confidence, and his music confirms the instrumentation found in the vernacular music of Cornwall in the early 18th century.
In December 2000, a Devon based scholar and a friend of ours, Bob Patton, was researching the Cornish carols collected by Davis Gilbert in the then record office. He noticed a box labelled miscellaneous. In there was sheet music that wasn't yet separately catalogued. And there were letters. Letters sent to Davis Gilbert's father as a young man and a small handwritten book of tunes on which Gilbert had written, I believe this little book to have been my grandfather's, Mr John Giddy. It was immediately clear that this document was important in Cornish music history. It had been overlooked by previous researchers and it was earlier than most other manuscripts of its type. As we heard, it contained some 40, 64 pieces of social music, mostly unattributed and untitled, much unknown, but all interesting. So the next challenge was to make these tunes accessible, acceptable to 21st century musicians. Over the next two months, Mike photographed and transcribed all the playable music. It was a laborious task, as over the years, the ink marks had spread. Using a magnifying glass in some cases, Mike needed to focus on the very spot that the quill had touched to determine the correct note to be used. I'm not a musician. I worked alongside him, reading and noting any instruments, any items of interest in the archive of all those letters. And the bills and the estate documents, and so on. The next challenge was to make those tunes memorable. We wanted to link John's world with his music. And when we read the letters from John Giddy to his son Edward, there, in the same handwriting as the music book, was a chatty, family-focused set of memories. Just 250 years old. As many of the tunes had no names, Mike made the decision, with quite a lot of caveats, to give them titles. It's always far easier to remember a tune by a name than by a number. The few names given by John were always retained, even to using the original spelling. For the untitled tunes, we selected family and local place names that felt right for that specific tune. There were names that John Kiddy himself would have recognised, gleaned from his own letters. John was a lively correspondent and he kept his son entertained by seemingly random pieces of family information. He mentioned in one letter that your great uncle William's gout is much improved. So a slightly quirky but fun tune became Uncle William's gout. <laughs> One of the most lyrical and now one of the most popular tunes was called Anna Collins, after John's wife. In 2001, with the kind permission of the Davis Gilbert estate and the then Cornwall Record Office, Mike's transcriptions were published under the title Echoes of Old Key. And as a result, these tunes have survived and they can now be enjoyed by musicians and their listeners from Cornwall, the rest of Britain and beyond. In 2010, Anna Collins was collected as a wedding music by some folk friends of ours. They got married in Wales. They'd chosen a tune once played by a Cornish 18th century tinnersayer and farmer of no personal fame. Lost for 250 years, rediscovered completely by chance, transcribed and named after John Giddy's bride, Musicians from all over Britain, Ireland and the United States were able to come together to play this Cornish music as a scratch band. We hope it will be continued to be enjoyed for years to come. Thank you. 
John Giddy's book is one of our earliest windows on social music in Cornwall. It gives an insight into the instrumental music of middle-class Cornwall in the 18th century, a mix of dances, some of which were old even in Giddy's day, the latest pop songs and light classics, some allegedly by Handel. But of course, in those days, classifications like that did not exist. People just played the music they liked. It's clear from this manuscript and others found more recently that Cornwall's musicians were not out of touch with fashionable London and Bath, yet many of John's tunes are unknown elsewhere, so they're clearly local either in origin or else favour. Some of the music has an interesting modal feel, as do some of the tunes in early Playford collections, and this may have been a cultural preference, harking back to earlier times. John Giddy's love of music was passed to his sons, Edward, who learned the fiddle, and Thomas, who organised many concerts and musical evenings in Penzance. Importantly, Giddy's interest was passed to his grandson, Davies Gilbert, who went on to become president of the Royal Society and did invaluable work in collecting and publishing early Cornish carols, some going back to medieval times, and many of which we sing to this day. Thank you very much for your kind attention this afternoon. I greatly appreciate everybody for coming out here. And it's a complete delight to be able to perform and, and talk with real people as opposed to people on a screen on Zoom or uh, FaceTime or whatever. Uh, so thank you very much for coming along. Thank you uh, to uh, Bob for photographing uh, this event. Thank you to my partners in crime, to my lovely wife Tina and to my lovely accompanist uh, Barbara Griggs. Thank you very much for your contributions. And a special thanks, of course, to uh, Crescent Kerno. It's an invaluable resource that we have here in Cornwall. Um, please do make full use of it. Please tell people how much you love it. Please do press the like button on <laughs> Facebook or whatever other social media that you use uh, because it's important that this resource uh, remains a thriving resource for not just us musicians, but for the whole of Cornwall. Uh, thanks to Crescent Kerno, even after nearly three centuries, uh, we can still hear the echoes of old key.
Thank you. Thank you.